Following on from our video focusing on compression spring force, deflection and rate, we can now go into spring stress. As before, we need to break up the spring into its individual components in order to study the changing stresses. We know the spring will only be used between max and minimum loaded lengths, but the free and solid lengths are still relevant. We need to label each length so we can observe where they sit on the spring force profile. We learned previously, minimum and max working lengths range from 20 to 80% compression. The fully compressed solid length being beyond the safe working zone. But what does this mean? OK, so let's plot the spring force profile against compression. I've put some arbitrary figures into this graph just for illustration purposes. So we start with a curve that flattens into a linear profile as the spring expands. If we overlay solid length or L4, you can see we are way off the linear path. We will attempt to reason why in a minute. At the opposite end of the profile, we find the free length. The max loaded length for 80% compression marks the point when the profile straightens and in reality represents the shortest length the spring can be compressed to whereby the mass is reliable. The zone between L3 and L4 marks the zone of, un zone of unpredictability. And this is where the spring may begin to plastically deform. Spring makers in some cases will compress to solid in order to induce favorable opposing compressive tensile residual stresses. The pro this process is called set removal and is conducted to remove residual bending stresses produced when the core was first formed. The force on the curve in this region cannot be reliably calculated and the designer should avoid this region unless advised differently by the spring manufacturer. At the opposite end, we have the minimum working length. And similarly, the min working length is set back by 20%. Here we see manufacturing conditions causing variability. Processes such as set removal, whereby the manufacturer compresses to solid on first operation, may cause the free length to change. So 20% compression marks the first point whereby we can again calculate reliably. During manufacture, we can say the process of reforming a straight piece of spring grade material plastically deforms the wire in order to retain its cold form. The material is stressed beyond yield. In unloading, the spring decompresses from the plastic zone, but it retains its new coiled shape and retains the residual stress from the forming process. Set removal is possible if spring stress exceeds yield as it is compressed to solid length. Set removal replaces manufacturer residual bending stress with beneficial torsional compressive tensile residual stress. The spring free length stabilizes from the process and the load carrying ability increases. During operation, the maximum working length could reach yield if the spring is used in static application. But this working length is usually decreased to prevent failure or excessive relaxation. In real world operation, compressing the spring generates torsional stress. This is due to a reduction in the pitch. Shear stress also appears opposing the direction of travel. In unloading, the torsional stress reverses direction as the pitch returns. The shear stress also reverses direction during extension. The shear stress is uniform across the section, yet in torsion, the stress profile peaks at the OD and ID and neutralizes across the center. Or at least it would if it wasn't for curvature effect. Bending stress is induced during the forming process, bias is torsion. This leads to increased stress at the ID of the spring. Overlaying both compression and torsion increases ID stress further. And it is at the ID that we need to measure peak stress, as this is where initial failure will occur. The shift in stress needs to be quantified in stress calculations. Curvature effect and the application of stress correction to account for the shift is discussed in the second part of this video on spring stress.